smell away. This rub. Crazy trail. the warmest place in the morning yet. Not yet. Uh, it's funny, let's look at this, this old axe. I guess you can't really tell, but the handle is withered down to like this, and the head of the axe is just rusted to rat shit. And the story behind that axe is we were extremely remote, northern, northwest, north central British Columbia, and uh, waiting for that yellow bush plane that you guys seen in the beginning of some of the entries into my videos 
And uh, I look down, and that axe is laying in the water, in the edge of this lake. I'm like, holy shit, look at this. And how many freaking years that axe has been sitting in the lake? Who knows? So I grab it, and I pack it home. That's the story of that axe behind me. Never know who brought it there, who made it, who bought it. What that axe has seen to travel in there on the side of a saddle. Who knows? Cool little find though, right? Yeah. Gonna get right into it. Because after this, it's gonna be forest mountain time with me and the dog for a few days. Dear Steve in the Round Table, on a brief spiritual note, I have strong spiritual beliefs and they are from a multitude of various, quote, religions, end quote, some known and most rare. It is my belief you have been chosen. You are chosen for this time and in this place. One of the many reasons is because you are seeking wisdom and sharing it with the masses. Quote, the truth, end quote. What a concept. I'm thankful for every video, every picture, every share, every rant, and your humor is timeless. Thank you. Millions are seeking answers to their own puzzle pass, as you have stated, and bam, there you are. I'm forever grateful and indebted to see your passionate and zealous enthusiasm in pursuit of the truth. I have a thought about something, and I'd like to know what you and the round table think, so here it goes. All right, appreciate the kind words. Our world leaders feel the world is overpopulated and designed a way to thin it out, up close and personal, and for the long haul of things to come. I heard it mentioned that it appears that we, are have, that we have sightings more than ever now. Maybe because the woodlands are being taken, are being taken. Maybe because of this club where people can freely tell the truth. Maybe even because of being able to speak to so many people around the world outside of a, of a stage or platform. I also think that maybe their population has actually grown just as ours has. Their predators are the greys and men, as far as I know. Owl men, related that you have more than likely been named by the Sabe just as he has been named Owl Man due to his connection with owls, among and among other things, a high regard of respect. I long to know your Sabe name. Maybe you could ask Owl Man to inquire. Let us know when you know. You go to the outdoors and read our shares, stories of Sabe's, their actions toward man in lending help, exhibiting protective behaviors, communicating, developing co-existing relationship, those having bad behaviors, hunting abilities, and more over the Sabe's interactions with all of us from around the world. Of course, it, let's not forget how they find humor or joy in scaring and terrifying a man. If I were a Sabe, I would come to listen to the note from home, end quote, or the, quote, the latest gossip from abroad, end quote. This, of course, is you, Steve. I think many Sabe would bring their youngsters slash teen Sabe's to see you from a distance to learn so many things from you. They would be taught about a man who has full knowledge of the Sabe's existence, have the kids practice reading human intent while they are safe being around a man with weapons, maybe even show teach them how to throw a rock or two with no fear of, from, of them being shot, maybe to try a little mind speak and to learn the English language. The kids learn so much from you because of the global shares, including, but not limited to your statements that you, man, are allowed to be there. The forest and the animals belong to man also. That the old red eyes <clears throat> around the world are just like their mean and cranky old uncle that they can steer clear of. I just learned from Kevin of the Arizona Four that Sabe prefers to be called and or referred to as the people. They are not Nephilim. They have families, a culture, a hierarchy just like us. They are full of love and a broad range of emotions. Trust is paramount. Their belief system makes trust the most utmost imperative character of life. I looked it up so I had a clear understanding. Trust means the firm belief in their reliability truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. I could go on and on with all the information that the shares supply, but shall digress at this point. I've learned so, so very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you will never come, will, sorry, will never cover the amount of gratitude and respect I have for you, bringing so many important people into the club that have so much wisdom and so much pertinent information to help all of us. 
not just you. We're all obtaining those pieces of puzzle that fit each of our individual lives. For one man to accomplish this, well, has been chosen. To enter a hot zone, a national or a state park or areas around the large power line towers or any forested area, I would mentally or verbally state, as we have been taught, I am here to hike a trail, camp, hunt for my food, to feed my family, or stating why I am there, that I don't need to see you, the Sabe. Don't want to harm the trees or woodlands, and want to leave peacefully. All the while, I would have my arms outstretched with my palms up. In ending this conversation, I would tell them that I bring blessings to you, the Sabe, from the One, the Great Creator. Bowing shows respect at this point as well. When coming, or in the least when leaving, is to leave them an offering such as tobacco leaves, which we all need to know where to obtain and what kind is more preferred. Do not mock them with knocking on trees, even if you hear that sound, nor scream back if you hear that. They do get offended. They are curious and may be in your immediate area, so mind speak or verbally tell them not to frighten you. If you can't get a resolve then you are, and you are frightened, then call it the name of our Lord by saying out loud, Leave me slash us alone in the name of Jesus Christ, end quote. And from all the shares I've heard that do this, it works. They sometimes warn us off because of danger ahead, such as an open portal, wild animals, or possibly aliens in the area. I feel they have a contract or agreement with the Greys for providing sustenance to them that they need. Minerals, certain vegetations, tree sapling, heck, I don't know. But they are intertwined together. Sabe seem to be slaves of the Greys, in my opinion. I've also learned here that Sabe do not like the Greys because the Greys take their children. They have in their family dynamics the good, the bad, and the ugly, just as we do. They are far more intelligent than we will ever be, partly because they have always known the truth. There's a... Uh, there's a little sentence right there to take note of, right? Partly because they have always known the truth. What a position that would be in. They do not have a great ability toward logical reasoning. What I mean is, if they we have a bad winter storm coming and someone leaves blankets as an offering, one must wrap the blanket around themselves and mentally or verbally explain that it is to keep the children warm in this matter. When hunting is successful, always leave the liver and slash or the organ meats as an offering. Never whistle in the outback of force and never respond to a whistle you may hear. Always listen to your instincts and slash your guts. We want to be left alone as they do. We've entered their assigned territory, the state and national parks. Much like how the government assigned our Native Americans on their spe specified reservation. I believe with their deforestated deforestation <clears throat> by mankind include, <clears throat> excuse me, including, but not limited to the, to all the forest fires, they have had no choice but to encroach into our homelands, farms, rural areas, and even towns. The government and, or, and others, now with their backs against the wall, are about to do something. Telling the truth is too late. We here have found the truth and are still learning the depths of hundreds of thousands of years in one lifetime. Can we learn it all? We must inform our children to spare them some of the bitterness of being lied to. They will continue to learn further depths that we couldn't reach if they had a beginning knowledge now through us. I agreed with that one. We are responsible to inform them and to help feed their knowledge of those things hidden that are so important. We now know that mankind is not the only inhabitant on this planet outside of the mammals, reptiles, and animals. I was scared listening to the first few videos. I now wait and long for the next one because I am learning my truth. God bless everyone who listens, but also can hear. Steve, may your life reap the rewards and graces of heaven while you and yours are still on this earth. I raise your name coupled with your family to the heavens daily for your protection and for your peace of mind. May God continue to show you your path and may thousands of blessings be bestowed upon you and your rock of a family. God bless all at the round table of knowledge. I recognize the strength, but you asked what we all here have learned. So, as it shows, I have learned much more than I ever knew until this writing. 
Cheryl Scarborough, Houston, Texas. Cheryl, we all appreciate your email and your time you just took out of your life to share that with us. Big time. Thank you. And there you go. Somebody is cruising right along on their ride. Right? Cruising right along. Picking up puzzle pieces and sharing. And seeing the importance of sharing the truth. It's funny, I, I can't say, you know, maybe in the States, I do know, I haven't been in any of the mountainous states myself yet. I haven't been lucky enough to run around there yet, but I have spent a lot of time in the woods in the south states, southeast states, um, a little bit in Texas, and I do realize there is a lot of land that's bought up and it's hard for a lot of people to get out in the forest because they don't own a, a lease or belong to a hunting club. And that may possibly fit what you just shared about the uh, they're losing land down there, but up here it's not the case. I mean, we have a lot of um, a lot of a lot of logging. That's for sure. A lot of logging, a lot of mining. But British Columbia, Canada as a whole, Yukon, Alaska is absolutely covered in what possibly could be described as impenetrable <laughs> mountains and valleys. There's shit piles of land here for if there was a being that lived here full time and needed that seclusion, we got it. And if anything, um, if they needed to avoid us at all costs, they could do it easily, but they don't. They still choose to sh show up. I'm not convinced they exist here full time myself. I'm not convinced yet. If they, and I, that's uh, when I say the word here, meaning right here on this ground, this dirt right beside me, in that forest, in that mountain. I don't know, there's, there's something, obviously there is something very confusing going on that we are having a real tough time wrapping our noggins around. There's the possibility of a parallel existence somewhere around us, right? That is something I lack um, theories or knowledge on, but I have a strong, strong gut feeling that's what's going on. So, knowing that, do they need the physical area that is present with us daily? I don't know, I'm not convinced of it myself. I don't know, I don't know. It's a very confusing, very confusing point to uh, dive into and look at, try to figure out and learn, figure out, right? Very confusing, but from the people who have dedicated a shit pile of their professional lives to trying to figure this out, um, one thing for certain is there is a very strong, what we have labeled, supernatural factor that accompanies these beings and more. That, for me, is absolute truth. There's no way of escaping that as far as I'm concerned from what I've learned for me on my ride. That's just me and my puzzle. Because we all have our own puzzle, we all have our own opinions, we're all learning, and I do not need anybody to jump on my bandwagon when it comes to anything. All I need to do is figure my shit out for myself and share what I've got with all the people I can once I feel absolute confident what I've discovered and learned is, is fact. So, that's a bit of a rant, not a rant, but of a babble about um, the thought that they are running out of area to ex exist. That's a tough one for me to, to uh, jump on that one myself from what I've learned, what I've seen. And watchers caretakers of the forest. Not a chance. That I can easily prove. <laughs> There's, if that was their job, they're absolutely failing. Fail across the board. You know, we just spent a lot of time in um, the mountains in Vancouver Round a couple days ago, and this is actually a quote from a logger friend of mine. We're talking about a mill, a huge mill that's been here forever in town, sold uh, the First Nations um, community purchased the mill, but it can't be ran because it is only tooled for old growth logs and there's none left. Quote, there's none left. It's from a logger. So, there's no more old growth logs left to run through that mill here in Vancouver Brown. So that right there is an absolute <laughs> in-your-face failure. If there was some kind of uh, large 
human, not human being, who is, quote, the caretakers of the forest. Not these forests. I'm fortunate, but, or is it? I don't know. Anyway, it's another topic. Thank you so much for that email. Thank you so much. Now, here comes another one. This is titled, Strange Encounters in Texas, Part 1. I see if I sent this email a few days ago, but believe I sent it to the wrong email address, so I'm resending it. Please don't use my real name. I'm about the age that I really don't give a shit if people believe me or not, but I'm not trying to draw attention to my kids who still live in the area where these encounters took place. It's a very small town where everybody knows everyone. I've been watching your videos for a while now, and have finally gathered the courage to share the experiences that I've have happened to my family and myself. I say courage because it's hard to talk about these things without feeling a little crazy. But I know what I experienced and have no reason to doubt the experiences of my family members. I'm hoping that by sharing these experiences with you and your viewers that maybe someone has similar experiences and can, can provide some insight. Several of these encounters were experienced by my family members and myself several years apart. I'll apologize in advance as this email will be long, but I can't but wonder if these experiences are interconnected or just the luck of the draw. Bigfoot Encounters My hometown is a small town of around 800 people in the Big Thicket region of Texas. At about 45 minutes drive from the epicenter of the Big Thicket National Preserve in Hardin County, Texas. Tales of the Big Thicket Booger have been told for well over 100 years, but I never took it too seriously until I had my own experiences. As a child, my native grandmother would warn me not to stray too far from her house when I'd spend the night with her because, quote, the hairy man in the woods, end quote, would get me. The first time that she said that to me, I scoffed, thinking that she was just trying to scare me, and asked her how she knew that a hairy man was in the woods. My grandmother, who was Choctaw and Chitimacha, Indian descent told me a story of how her three brothers were chased out of the woods while squirrel hunting by a beast that her father called Champe. The boys were deep in the acreage behind the farmhouse when they witnessed a seven to eight foot tall man-like monster covered from head to toe in blackish brown hair. The creature bellowed at the boys as it swayed side to side in what they called a threatening manner before baring its teeth at them. Needless to say, the brothers packed it out of there. My grandma said her oldest brother, Jack, was white as a ghost when they reached the back porch of the house. After they'd caught their breath and settled down, they told my great-grandfather what had happened. He explained that it was a champé, a smelly, fur-covered, man-eating creature, and then told the boys that squirrel season was over until that thing was no longer in the woods. I asked my grandmother to tell me more, but she refused, believing that talking about such creatures would draw them to you. The story she told me happened in the 30s, and 50 years later, she was still uncomfortable relating the story to anyone. She did, however, state that the oldest brother refused to go hunting ever again after the experience. <clears throat> no doubt. As that boy, Jack, was killed in an auto accident in the 50s, and Grandma refused to talk any more about it. I asked my great uncle Manuel about it when he was a teenager. Oh, sugar, he said, you don't need to know about the scary things like that. And pretty much ended the conversation on the subject. I couldn't help but notice a change in his demeanor, as though my question had brought forth a long buried unpleasant memory. Fast forward to 2007. I was working the night shift at my job, and my brother, and my brother met me outside as soon as I pulled up in the driveway around 11.30 p.m. He was visibly shaken as we walked into the house and began to tell me what had him scared so much. He said that he was laying in bed talking to his girlfriend on the phone when something ran what he thought were fingernails across the back side of the house and above his bedroom window. Honestly, I had a hard time taking him serious as we lived in a mobile home at the time and the home sat around three feet off the ground. Something would have a pretty damn tall would have to be pretty damn tall to run their fingers above his window. The next day, my brother and his best friend decided to investigate the woods next to our property. That acreage was owned by the sawmill and quite dense. 
They end up finding a path through the woods about four feet wide with branches broken up to what he estimated eight feet in the trees along the path. Again, I didn't take my brother seriously until I and my daughter would have our own experiences a few years later. In the summer of 2013, my daughter, age 12 at the time, was next door at my cousin's house playing outside with his white German Shepherd. I'd yelled at her that my aunt and I were going to pick, pick up burgers and would be back soon. When we arrived home, my daughter was sitting on the couch hysterical, shaking and crying so bad that it took about 20 minutes to calm her down before she could tell me what had happened. She said that as she was playing with the dog, she heard what sounded like a baseball bat hitting a tree not far from where she was playing. Then she heard heavy footsteps and the sound of branches snapping. The dog, who was normally aggressive to sounds from the woods, began to whimper and back away from the daughter before running up to my cousin's house, begging to be let in. Needless to say, my daughter ran to my house and waited for me to come home. It would be two years before she'd go near the woods again. About six months after the incident, I was digging up lantana bushes at my house to transplant in my grandmother's front yard when the woods became very silent. Several birds flew from the forest into the clearing behind my house. I then heard a tree knock, just like the one my daughter had described. I said, at this shit, grab my shovel, and then I went next door to my grandmother's house. I wouldn't say that I was scared, but I had no desire to stick around and possibly see what was making that noise. Been there. <laughs> it wouldn't be until July 2020 when I would have an encounter that shook me to my core. That year I'd lost my house and converted my 96 GMC Suburban into a living space. I ripped out the middle row seating and built in and built in floor storage that would also serve as a place to lay my inflatable mattress. I also rigged up some hardware cloth, a type of metal mesh wire, inside over the window area of the two backside doors of Suburban as my cat was living with me. I needed to be able to roll down the back windows without him escaping outside. I've included a couple of photos of the setup to give you an idea of how I was laying when the scary incident happened. These photos are for your eyes only. I know nearly everyone in my town and they've seen my vehicle. I've since moved out of the state, but my kids still live in the town as adults and I don't want to draw any unwanted attention their way as most who know me have seen my vehicle and the alterations I made to it. Anyway, I was parking my SUV at my aunt's house I would sleep on her land at night. Excuse me. And as it was the height of a hot, humid Texas summer, I had the front seat windows rolled down about three inches and the back seat windows rolled down about 10 inches. I had come home from work around 11 p.m. and picked up my cat for my aunt. She'd watch him while I was at work as it was too hot for him to be in the kennel outside during the day. I turned on the two battery operated fans that I had for cross ventilation and tried to cool off in order to fall asleep. I was still awake around 1 a.m. as it was still in the low 90s temperature wise. My cat had fallen asleep on my stomach and was snoozing away. I checked my phone to see what time it was when suddenly my cat woke up and stood on top of my chest like a human. It freaked me out because I've never seen him do this and he was looking straight out that wire covered window behind my head. Panic started to set in as I watched him standing there for a full two minutes before the smell hit me. It was like a skunk, a wet dog, and a soured dumpster all rolled into one. When the smell hit, the cat ran and hid the back part of the Suburban. Slowly I slipped up to the front seat, turned the key of the ignition, so I rolled up both windows on the right side of my vehicle. This is the side that was facing the woods. Then I reached the, by the driver's seat and grabbed my Glock 19 and eased myself back into the middle section of the Suburban where I'd made my bed. I laid low with my head under the left window and the Glock aimed straight at the window across from me. With my free hand I grabbed my extra mags and waited. At night I always kept a round chamber in case anyone decided to creep up on my vehicle. Both the mag in my Glock and the extra mags were candy cane with defense rounds and hollow points alternated. I prayed like hell that whatever was out there would just go away. I'd heard no sounds, nor seen any shadows moving, just that awful rank smell that permeated my vehicle a good 20 minutes. Luckily whatever was there disappeared. 
I stayed awake, didn't move from my spot until after the sun had risen. At that point, I moved to the front seat, hid my firearm, and went to go get coffee at the local gas station. Pulling into my aunt's driveway, I saw her front door open. So after parking, I went and knocked on her glassed, glassed, glass storm door. She was surprised to see me up so early. I told her about what had happened and she remembered how for the past three nights she had to force her dog to go outside to the bathroom. He seemed to be really scared of something as he would stare at the woods and would only do his business if my aunt was standing on the front porch. My aunt asked me if I'd noticed that the coyotes had been silent for the past week. I said yes, that I'd noticed as they no longer howled when the train would come through town at night. She then said something that made my blood curdle. The week before the woods became silent, she went into the kitchen to make herself a snack. Suddenly she heard what sounded like a coyote being killed. It was loud enough that her son grabbed a shotgun before going out onto the back porch to see what the commotion was about. As soon as he went outside, there was silence. I stared at the kitchen counter and thanked my lucky stars that whatever had made itself known to me, whatever had killed that coyote, had left without showing itself to me. Lord knows that I certainly didn't want to have a fire at some, have to fire at some predator from inside my vehicle. Later on that day, I searched online about cats standing on their hind legs like people. The search came up that cats will do this when they see a big predator in order to make themselves appear bigger. Well, a bit of information certainly didn't make me feel any better, lol. Just thinking about, as I write to you, gives me that awful pit of the stomach feeling. I had no other experiences before I moved to Georgia to live with my boyfriend the following month. The only weird experience that I've had since then was while the boyfriend and I had took a hike in North Georgia the week after I moved there. We hiked a trail to go see the Blue Hole Falls, a beautiful yet secluded waterfall. Halfway through the hike, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us. I don't know, maybe I'm just paranoid, but I couldn't shake the feeling. As we hiked out of the area, the rank, now familiar smell hit my nose. I told my boyfriend that we needed to hurry up and get out of there. He asked why I was in a hurry, and I said, there's something very squatchy about this place and I don't like it. Needless to say, I felt a relief leaving the area. I have absolutely no desire to see a champé, sabe, or whatever else they are called, but I can't help but be fascinated and have so many questions. Some people say they are gentle forest creatures, but I don't buy that. My grandmother, as told to her by her father, said that they kidnap and eat people. I'm now in my late 40s and I believe her. Anyway, thank you Steve for all you do and providing a meeting and for providing a meeting place for those that have had experiences or just have simple curiosity. Just know that you and your channel are seriously appreciated. Maybe one day we'll get the answers we seek. I have other experiences that I and my family members have experienced regarding Dogman, a glowing blue diamond in the sky, possible UFO, and Black Panthers that our Texas game wardens swear don't exist, but I'll save those for another email as I've written a novel here, lol. Thank you for taking the time to read my email. Best wishes to you and yours, signed. Okay, I'm not... Oh, it's okay? Okay. Signed, Angel. It's my nickname around these parts of Georgia and okay to use. All right, thanks for that email. The Big Thicket. I've heard the Big Thicket come up so many times online, in emails. The Big Thicket. I'm not familiar with it. It must be a big chunk of timber, right? I'm guessing. Yes, all I know is I remember when I was uh, on the Nueces River, Uvalde, Texas, in spring, it was so hot. I just could not believe how hot it was. Even at 10 o'clock at night, it was enough to kill me being from Canada, right? It's hot in Texas. I remember finding it so hard to believe there's even deer existing there. But there was the tracks in that, in that uh, rather fine powder soil, sand, dirt, whatever you want to call it. The Big Thick of Texas, Oklahoma. I wonder what's up with that area. Why is that so popular down there for, for these beings to frequent? I wonder why. I wonder what's up. I guess they're in every state though, aren't they? Right? Every state, every province, every continent. Appreciate your email. Alright. Let's get another one going. I gotta get ripping. 
First Encounter at Eight Years Old is the title of this. My name is Linda. I've been listening for about a year. I want to share a few experiences I've had. First of all, thanks for changing. Thanks for changing companies for your products. My order, my orders took almost two months to receive. I figured you wouldn't put up with that for long. Thanks. Yeah, it's frustrating. My first experience at Sabe was when I was living in Wyoming, Michigan. I've heard you read a number of emails with settings from around that area. I was eight years old and it was the last day of school and I decided to cut across the plowed fields to get home and save about 20 minutes. None of us other kids, none of the other kids wanted to come with me, so I headed off towards home. I'd always sing as I walk and not go into any depth. I learned how to mind speak at a very young age. Wow. As I was walking, I saw an old red truck facing me, sitting to my right, out where the two fields met. The wheels were gone, as was all the chrome windows and lights. The passenger door was closed and the driver's door opened about halfway. I looked at it and saw no one and walked around the back of it, not looking at it as, as I passed. He must have been laying in the cab and heard my singing. I got about 20 feet past it and heard in mind speak, what are you doing here? Like you would say if you locked up the dog and then found it sitting on your porch a few hours later. At that point in my life, all I knew was mind speak. All I knew was mind speak was with angels. And so I thought he must be friendly and I turned around. I saw what I thought was a friend of my best friend's brothers. I didn't question why he could mind speak because I figured everyone could if they wanted to. I started walking toward the truck. He leaned forward out of the driver's door window area. As I walked, I asked, what's your name? And he said, he said, you would say. The first part sounded like Ken, but I can't, I can't write the sound of the second part, really. I'd rather not tell it to everyone. I walked to within a few feet of him, and he leaned out further. He was looking down just a bit, and I was looking up. I would say he was at my 10 o'clock. We just stared at each other. His skin was like my mom's kid gloves, K-I-D-D -D gloves. It was much thicker looking than mine. He had freckles and red hair. His nose looked like my brother's, which had been broken so many, from so many fights that even after surgical repair looked flattened and broad. He had thinnish lips and teeth like ours. His eyes were a golden brown and, to me, showed expression. I got the distinct impression that he was young, late teens. As we stared at each other, I started, asking, I started asking questions. Please remember, I was only eight years old. I first asked him in mind speak, how come your parents let you grow your hair so long? He didn't answer, but I could see a smile coming across his face. I then asked, why are you allowed to go to school with a beard? Then. Where's your neck? I can't see you have a neck. And with that, he broke into a smile. As I was going to ask another question, his attention was broken by something to his left. He looked back at me with a worried expression and said, Go now, with power in the words. I turned and started walking away. I got to the hole in the hedge that separated the field from the street and a four-foot drop and turned around to wave goodbye. He had exited the truck and was standing on the other side of the cab. I was shocked that he was so tall. My dad and grandfather were six foot four. He was at least a foot or more taller. He was, looking, he was looking toward my right, but I could not see what was going on from the protection of the hedge. He was flailing his arms and then he saw me, and then he saw me standing there. He said, go now, don't come back. And I said, you're mean but I didn't move. All of a sudden I heard someone screaming and realized it was me. He had sent what I call a cloud of fear at me and my body reacted. I turned and ran through the hedge, jumped down the embankment and ran down the street to my house. When I got home I told my mom about what had happened and that he had red hair and I told her his name was Kenny. She said she would find out who he belonged to. That meant his mom. So she could smack some sense into him. Well, two days later, my mom came home from the store and told me she stopped at both farms attached to the fields. 
neither of them had a red-headed son. My mom claimed Chickasaw heritage, Chickasaw heritage, and followed native beliefs, and she told me that Kenny was a forest person who lives in the woods. I told her he was nice at first, but then told me not to come back. She said if he had told me not to go back, then respect his wishes and do not go back there. And that was that. Until that point, I believed that he was just one of the boys that hung around with my friend's brothers. And I have to add, if he smelled, I would have told him he needed a bath. I wasn't shocked about forest people, but I was pissed about not being able to go back to see him again. As years passed, I realized that he wasn't, a, he wasn't being mean. He was protecting me from whatever was coming from the woods. I got the impression that he was not where he was supposed to be either. Shortly after that, we moved out of the state. This whole thing is like it happened yesterday. I can close my eyes and see him clearly, clearly. And it happened in 1957. The fields are all houses now. I haven't heard of this happening to anyone else, but I'm sure it has, and I am including it so they know they aren't alone. I was in my early 20s living in Ohio, and a friend wanted me to ride with her to pick up some friends from a party in the park and then take them home. I went. And when we got there, I found out it was up on a hill in the woods. I didn't want to go. It was getting near dark and I wasn't comfortable about it. I went, in, I went anyway. We walked up the path and could hear music from the forest. We got just inside the tree line and I told her I wanted to wait there while she collected her friends. She left and went deeper into the woods. This was in the 70s. We drugs all over the place. And as I stood there, I got an uneasy feeling. It was now getting dark and I could feel evil approaching. Then I heard a mind speak voice saying, You are in a bad place, but if you follow my instructions, you'll be safe. Do exactly as I say when I say it. I said, Okay. He said, Move back by the tree to your right and stand close to it. As I moved back, I saw two mean looking guys enter the tree line. Then I saw their guns in their belts. There's no place for me to run. They're on the only pathway out. The voice told me, hold very still, do not move, no matter what, and no one will see you. Well, I had no choice, so I stood as still as possible. The two men walked right past me within inches of me. My friend came looking for me. She was only a few feet from me, calling my name, and actually looked my direction, but didn't see me. She went back into the crowd. And all of a sudden, she came out, walking quickly with her friends and telling them she hopes I made it out. As they passed me, the voice told me, move now. As I took a step, I blinked and was down the hill at the van. The girls were all running down the hill, and my friend told me to jump into the van so we can leave ASAP. She said she had looked for me all over and even looked by the van, so how did I get there ahead of them? I told her I had been standing around, then headed up to the van. No one saw me while I was standing by the tree. The odd thing is that all the girls had mosquito bites all over them, but I only had the two I had when I went into the woods. I saw people look my direction while I was standing next to the tree, but they did not see me. I knew some of them, but they didn't know I was there. I moved to Missouri and actually knew a number of people who had seen Momo, but I never equated the Missouri monster with the forest people. My guy wasn't a monster. In 2020, I'd moved back to Ohio into a villa on the edge of town with fields and a marsh all down the side. There was a ravine right up back, and I noticed a path worn in the grass the whole length of the, the community. Deer around on either side of the ravine, but not on my side. One night in May at 3 a.m., I heard two voices. I thought it was the drunk next door arguing with his son. I tried to go back to sleep, but then I noticed the voices were outside of my bedroom window and they were speaking what we would call gibberish. It sounded like a father with a son teaching him about hunting. Then the big one said something and the younger one replied like mocking his parent. Well, the bigger one laid into the smaller one with a stern voice and no response from the young one. I could not make myself get up. I couldn't move. After I heard them moving away, I could move. I looked out the back slider but could not see them. I just purchased a home and moved from there a month later. Sorry this is so long, but one, meme, one email is better than two. Thank you for being there for us. For us, many more things have happened to me right up to a few weeks ago. 
I'll be celebrating my 74th birthday this summer in the park. I love being outside. And unless my inner self tells me to leave, I stay and enjoy nature. End of email. Appreciate you and your, your time you just donated to us. There's a lot of people in the world who are familiar with what has been labeled mind speak, right? Isn't that amazing? What an amazing freaking skill or gift, whatever you want to call it. You know, I think I, I shared a little while back that I was trying to picture when I was in the woods hiking into that river. I was picturing what I would do and how I would react, but all of a sudden I heard some freaking stern voice between my ears. And I knew it wasn't me conjuring it up, and I knew it was factual and real. And I went, it would be really freaking crazy for all of us that haven't a clue what that must be like. That must be absolutely freaking bizarre to hear a voice with your mind, not your ears, right? And it's a pattern. It's a very, very strong pattern. It's something that you just cannot ignore. How do you deny it? How do you deny the mind speak thing that's been going on, right? You can't. Unless you're a dumbass, right? Think about it. You're gonna you're gonna deny the testimony of what is thousands of people now have have described and experienced the same thing when it comes to this mind speak thing. You have to be an absolute arrogant dumbass to look at thousands of people in the eye and go, "You're lying. You're not hearing that." <laughs> right? You see what I mean? You know how many people I've come across, even for in directly come across myself when it comes to certain things and they say, nope, didn't see it. They didn't see that. Can you imagine having a brain that told you that told you that you were in the position to dictate to somebody what they did or did not experience and you weren't even there, or dictate to somebody what they can or cannot do, even though you don't know, but yet you still think that you can sit on some kind of self-created pedestal and dictate to these people no, you didn't. <laughs> you know how ridiculous that is for real? How to make yourself look like an ass publicly. Perfectly. Just do that, right? Just tell a stranger what they did or did not see or experience. Anyway, I gotta go. I had a memory come up a little while ago. I'll show it another time. I got a little more time, but I have a feeling I was... I have a feeling I was ran out of the woods. Actually, I'll do it right now. What the hell? Because I'll probably forget, right? But... Where I had my first experience that scared the living shit out of me when I was bow hunting when I was a teenager alone. And I don't know how many of you people have watched the video where I shared that, that experience, but when I would hike, there's an old gate on that old deactivated road. You couldn't go up that road. And you had to hike up all the way up. And once you got to the top, it wasn't the very top, but it was the top of the road on that hip. And then I have to pass through where the rock bluffs and the big mature fir timber went up to my right and thick ass willow on both sides and then timber on the left and would carry along that ridge line. Where now that I know there is a pile of sightings in the down below and on top and a straight across. Now that I, I know now later on there is. But anyways, get this one's before I have my sighting, but I always still felt uneasy going through that particular patch of the timber until I got busted through. And there's a tiny little logged off area, power line, and I would sit there and wait, and it was freaking steep. We're talking straight down. Cliffs in that timber. I had a friend with me, a non-hunting friend, the same one I brought back later on to sit on that rock for comparison. And I shot a buck with my bow. And I was I was actually a very good shot when I was a kid. I shot instinctive, which means at the time you shoot with your fingers, but I have compound no sights because I am right-handed but I'm left eye dominant, and it was very confusing at the time to use sights in a bow, and I never used them. And I shot my bow every single day at home after school, even before school. I could, I was very accurate. And this buck was on the move. I was young, you know, I've only had a, at that time, I think I'd had maybe two or three or maybe four deer under my belt that I harvested my bow on my own. And um, this buck, these are small two point buck, but at that time I didn't care. I'll take anything. I wanted, I wanted to hunt so bad and wanted that deer so bad and I shot. I shot a little bit far back. And uh, boom, off he went, just blazing down over the rocks. And we're like, oh my god, I got one, I got one. You know, my friend was freaked out. Whenever there was a big blood trail, and he went right over this cliff. 
and then it was getting dark. So we hiked out. And I was all, oh, we'll, we'll get back up at first thing in the morning, we'll get up in the morning. It was just too dangerous to try to navigate around these these uh, cliffy bluffs. We got down there. It took quite a bit to, to crawl down there. And there he was. And I just got the knife to him, started to clean him out. And straight down below us, it sounded now, when I can remember it like it was yesterday. And it sounded like it was about, <clears throat> the sounds that were coming sounded like they maybe started off a couple hundred yards away. And it sounded to me like a pack of wild dogs. But at the time, on Vancouver Round, what I learned from the older guys in the bow hunting club that I've joined and other hunters, and we we're supposed to, the government says when you take your hunting course, you're supposed to shoot wild dogs on sight, and they are more dangerous than anything. Wild dogs. And there's uh, apparently a problem with wild dogs, wolf dog hybrids on the island, whatever. But here I am, a young hunter with a bow and arrow, and thinking, you know, wild dogs are really bad. It sounded like a pack of wild dogs coming, and they were coming fast, fast. And I couldn't even tell, it just sounded like that gibberish of a pack of dogs, you know? And now that I, now that I, what I've learned from, my, what I've learned from all of you on my ride along, and I look back on that memory, because we, we got, it was scared us so bad, we left, we left the deer. We're like, let's get out of here, because it was just coming up to us so fast. And uh, it was a really scary feeling and sound. And we ran back up that mountain. Um, fast and left the deer and never went back. Now, when I look back on it, there's no way that was a pack of dogs. Interesting, right? And it was right there where I had my experience. So, that's one time, uh, I don't even know why I remembered that, but I did. This past few days, I thought about it. And I've always, actually I've thought about this a handful of times over time, I guess, as I'm getting more knowledge from all of you too, right? And then we all are having that, a lot of us are having that happen. We are learning from each other and then we look back during our our time growing up and existing and think, oh, 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 oh yeah. This one time, right? It's kicking in, the memories are kicking in gear and and uh, and we're starting to figure out some mysteries from our past. Yeah. Because uh, when you're in the forest and you shoot a deer and you go to harvest it and you're in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden you don't just hear a pack of dogs barking and yipping and yapping and going crazy from 300 yards away straight down zeroing in on you perfectly. You see what I mean? There's some points in there to take to take in and take note of is that when a dog is on a scent only it's they're always going back and forth back and forth nose to the ground they're not barking Unless, well, I guess the hunting dogs are, though, aren't they? When they strike a scent of a bear or whatever, but they're trained to hunt, they're trained to do that. And um, I'm not a bear or a cougar. And these animals were whatever it was, was not going back and forth trying to catch a scent. They were just beelining, <laughs> ripping straight up those steep bluffs in that timber. And last heard, it sounded like they were right there in the timber. Like when we were really getting up above the cliff, it sounded like they were right there. Right there, a loss, and it was terrifying. Never thought much of it, right? Said everybody, right? But anyway, I gotta get ripping. I got a lot to do. I'm heading out to the coast again today, and I'm gonna stop along the way. I'm gonna take the dog, and I'm gonna get her to swim the river with me, and go down into that one steelhead hole and run my camera and see if there might a couple of maybe showed up on my travels, and then uh, carry on the boat. And I have to get a lot of stuff done out there, and. Um, We'll see if maybe I can't get some shares done while I'm out there and get them online too. We actually, I mentioned earlier, we bought the, uh, got that Starlink internet and I got it in the box in the house. Figured it was half price. So we got it, but then it's a hundred and something a month for the internet and you have to download the app, I guess, which I started to. I'm like, well, I don't need to, I don't need to start it up because I'm not going to use it for, I don't know when I'm going to use it yet. I almost was going to use it for right here until I managed to get that internet cable working. And uh, just this morning, sir, I said, I'm going to take it out to the boat, see if I can't get, I'll use the Starlink on the boat this next few days on the coast. And uh, so she goes, yeah, I just got on there right now and, and you're being charged right now. I'm like, what? No, <laughs> because you get charged, but you can shut it down and turn it on whenever you want for the charging of this internet service. So all this time, I'll be getting charged, damn it. So she shut it down.
I guess that's what happens when you first buy the Starlink equipment and everything. I guess they just automatically start charging you for that monthly fee. Note taken, shared with you guys just in case, right? So I'm going to give that a go. We'll see how that goes. And I get going. I've talked enough. And uh, I got a lot of emails, a lot of information to share. And I'll be back again.